Um, Professor Paul Krugman, Nobel Laureate and Professor of Economics at Princeton University, uh, distinguished ambassadors and guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, and also from my side, uh, welcome to everybody here, but also welcome to those among you who uh, attend this lecture in, through the virtual uh, means, through the virtual world. Uh, and therefore, I say a very good morning, but it may be well that for some of you it's a very good afternoon, a very good night, a very good whatever, uh, because we don't know exactly uh, where you are. Um, thank you for all for, uh, for joining us here today for the public lecture series that is organized by the SMU Simki Boon Institute for Financial Economics, SKBI, as we say in short. Today's lecture is titled Global Economic Outlook, Preventing the Next Crisis, and is delivered uh, by the 2008 Nobel Laureate for Economic Sciences, Professor Paul Krugman. Uh, it's indeed a very great honor for me and for us all to have him here at SMU to deliver that lecture. Uh, I had the privilege of meeting him once or twice before in other occasions, and I know that he was always up for a very good debate and uh, a few challenging statements. But we should not forget that Professor Paul Krugman received the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences in 2008 for his analysis of trade patterns and location of economic activity in the fields of international and regional economics. His work centered largely on international trade and finance, and he is one of the founders of the new trade theory, which represents a major, major rethinking of the theory of international trade. This theory explains patterns of trade among countries, including what goods are produced where and why. Traditional trade theory, as I still uh, learned it, uh, assumed that countries were, were different and will exchange only the kind of goods that they are comparatively better at producing. Now, we all know probably in this room that Professor Krugman set out to explain why worldwide trade was dominated by a few countries that were actually similar to one another and why a country might import the same kinds of goods it exports. He developed his work further to explain the effect of transportation costs on the places people choose to live in. His model explained the conditions which would lead people or companies to move to a particular region or to move away. Uh, but today, many of us probably will also know Pro uh, Professor Krugman's work or his current writing that is focused more on sort of the relationship between economics and the currency crisis and, and politics. And uh, these discussions are very critical and timely topics given our current, climate, uh, current economic climate in the world. Singapore is a very small and open, uh, an open country and an open economy, and we have our own uh, challenges in dealing with economic growth and inflation. In fact, in the wake of the recently announced inflation and economic growth figures in Singapore, today's lecture, what means that global economic outlook and how do we prevent the next crisis, comes at a very appropriate time. It can perhaps help us to shed some light on how Singapore can reassess its place in the global world economy. In addition, this highly relevant topic has broad appeal, especially in the face of the ever increasing economic uncertainty in the world around us. I'm confident that Professor Krugsman's lecture today will greatly contribute to our understanding of these important economic issues and provide, hopefully, valuable insights to economic planners in the regions. Now, I will take this opportunity to speak a few seconds about the SKBI, the Simki Boon Institute for Financial Economics. Uh, this is an institute, it is one of our major institutes within SMU that was established in July 2008 to promote the study of financial economics and financial econometrics in areas of strategic relevance to Singapore, Asia, and beyond. And one of the main objectives of the institute is to support Singapore's ambition to be a major international financial center and anchor SMU as a major think tank on financial economics. The Institute works closely with faculty members from our School of Economics, the Lee Kong Chiang School of Business, the School of Accountancy, as well as partners such as the Monetary Authority of Singapore, the Institute of Certified Public Accountants of Singapore, Securities Investors Association of Singapore, and the Singapore's Central Provident Fund Board, as all, all of us know, better known as the CPF. SKBI has hosted many distinguished visitors from all over the world and also from Singapore and organized numerous conferences since its launch about four years ago. Uh, one of them was, of course, current President Dr. Tony Tan Ken Yang, who was at that moment uh, the former Deputy Prime Minister and who was one of the speakers who spoke on the future of higher education at here at the SKBI's public lecture se series. 
We also are present not only with uh, research that goes in the academic sector or in uh, with organizing lectures like this, but we've also successfully created two indices for Singapore, namely the Inflation Expectations Index and the Corporate Governance Index. The Inflation Expectation Index, which is a joint effort between MasterCard and SMU, and it's an indication of how SMU likes to work together with the, uh, the, the business world, that indi uh, in the index measures household inflation expectations over the next one to five years and analyzes how different factors can affect households' perceptions towards inflation in the future. And on the other hand, the Corporate Governance Index, developed specific specifically for SIAS, is a comprehensive and unbiased corporate governance index for companies listed on the Singapore Stock Exchange. The research team at SKBI that is led by Professor Peter Phillips and Professor Jun Yu has also worked on the topic of asset price bubbles for many years. They have developed a new economic econometric methodology to test the presence of an asset price bubble and timestamp the origination date and the conclusion date of a bubble. They have been invited by quite a few central banks to present their work, and several have also implemented their method. So it's a significant institute for SMU that works closely together with industry and tries to produce both very relevant academic research, but also indices and uh, applied research that has direct impact on what's going on uh, in Singapore. And we translate that then in our teaching because in education, SMU has launched recently a new Masters of Science in Financial Economic Economics and has a collaboration with Citibank where we jointly launched Singapore's first city SMU financial literacy program for Singapore uh, youth. Uh, I would also like to uh, use this, this opportunity and this, uh, this, uh, to extend our very strong appreciation to our donors, uh, our spon sponsors, the Tanshin Tuan Foundation, who through their kind generosity have made this event possible. And thank you very much for supporting us. I wish you all a very engaging uh, lecture and discussion. Uh, and as I know, as we all know, we still can do that without knowing who is known, who has won the elections. So we still can speculate uh, about a number of things. Uh, maybe in two hours from now, a number of the ideas that we have at this stage will have a different, uh, or there will be a different light thrown on them. But it's my pleasure now uh, to invite uh, Professor Krugman on stage to deliver his lecture. Yes, thank, thanks everybody. Uh, th thanks to the university and to the institute for, for uh, yes. I'll go ahead. Okay, uh, for for uh, for this this opportunity to talk to you. Um, yeah, it's quite a. It, it, the timing is a little interesting. If you happen to be a, uh, an American with any interest in politics, um, and uh, so so that is weighing on my mind. Uh, I'll try to fight the temptation to keep on checking my mobile for uh, election results right in the middle because it, 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 it may very well be called while we're, while we're having this uh, session. It's, uh, we don't know that. Uh, but uh, um, actually, since I'm going to be talking about financial reform, this is actually in the U.S. A, a, an election that is, uh, to a significant extent, actually about financial reform, not, not the core of it. You might have expected that it, that would be at the, at the center of the election, and it is not. But, but uh, a lot of what what is you know what the biggest thing for the U.S. is is the issue of of healthcare probably um, the biggest the biggest thing that's at stake. But also we did have a significant financial reform, which I'm going to talk about uh, towards the end of this of this talk, uh, which will either survive or um, or be dismantled depending on what happens. And I, what I did see on my mobile just now is that uh, the architect of one of those pieces, one of the one of the key pieces of that financial reform, uh, Elizabeth Warren, the uh, the uh, consumer advocate and, and bankruptcy lawyer um, has just been elected to the U.S. Senate. So we actually have, if we don't know about Obama yet, although it looks likely, but, uh, but, but Elizabeth Warren is in, which is, again, the saying that this is all very, these things are all very relevant. Okay, so I want to talk, it, I, I've given many, many talks about the macroeconomic outlook. And I, I will have to say some things about that, but this is supposed to be a slightly longer term vision. Uh, what I want to talk about is the question of what, uh, uh, what, if any, progress have we made towards preventing a repeat of what just happened. And along with that, then, ah, there's a clock up there, so I don't need to do this. Uh, the, um, and and uh, 
That, that means, in turn, trying to figure out what actually did happen to us, uh, which then, in turn, leads us to some discussion of, of the outlook, because the, your, your view on the outlook depends a lot on your diagnosis of what did happen. So just in case you've been asleep for the last uh, five or six years, uh, we had um, a world economy that was doing pretty well, pretty good growth, uh, lots of encouraging stuff. There were, there were problems, certainly in the United States there was growing inequality. Um, there were questions about, about sustainability in lots of people's minds. But on the whole, it was a quite successful growth period. In Europe, uh, there were a lot of people hailing the euro as a, the single currency as a great success because it had been accompanied by a period of fairly vigorous growth. Um, the uh, obviously very fast growth in the emerging world altogether looking pretty good. And then abruptly, uh, it, it all came to pieces. Came to pieces very dramatically with a freezing up of financial markets and a plunge in world output. Um, and then, although that was contained, although we did not have a full replay of the Great Depression, uh, the recovery since has been painfully slow. By some standards, there's been no recovery at all in Europe. Uh, and uh, um, it's not, a, it's not the, the, the world we were led to expect. And the remarkable thing about that is that there were no external factors to explain this. This was not like the economic problems of the 1970s. There were no oil shocks. There were no raw material shortages. There was no, there was no war. Uh, this was entirely internally generated. Um, and the question, of course, is, is how can such a thing happen? Uh, how, can, how can we be in so much trouble? Uh, there's an ongoing discussion. Uh, there are people with all kinds of views. There, there's a significant part of, of the political spectrum in the United States that believes that that uh, excessive government intervention was the problem, uh, that which uh, a, fair, a fair number, you know, given that we have this election, it's impossible to avoid politics. There, there's a fair number of people who believe that this is all because of businesses afraid of, of Obama, uh, which requires some interesting, uh, interesting um, physics because he has to have traveled back in time to, uh, to, to, uh, to 2007 to unleash the financial crisis. Uh, but, but still, there's a fair number of people believing that. There's substantial belief also in the United States that it's actually a supply shock, in spite of everything, that we're actually seeing a, uh, a large uh, reduction in the willingness to work owing to increased regulation and, and enhanced social benefits. I won't spend a lot of time on that, but it does, it's worth pointing out that people, there are people who believe that. I think the, it, it's very hard to, to make that a defensible case, but it's, that, that's out there. Uh, in Europe, there's a lot of belief that the problem is in large part fiscal that irresponsible uh, fiscal, uh, irresponsible deficits, uh, excessive public debt is at the core of the crisis, which I don't see as being at all right. Uh, if you actually look at, at the story, it doesn't look that way at all. It's, it, it, it might be true for Greece, but it's not true for any of the other countries in, in trouble. Um, but mostly, uh, the, I think, taking aside the, the politically motivated uh, uh, positions that some people take in all of this. Uh, for the most part, what we look at is this is a dramatic collapse in aggregate demand. We've had an abrupt fall off in demand, um, which has, is not evenly distributed. And so part of the problem in Europe is that, that it's a, a huge fall off in demand in the countries that were previously receiving large inflows of capital. Um, and everything else is derivative from that. They have huge budget problems that come out of the collapse in demand, and they have, and also they have uh, huge budget problems that come from contingent financial liabilities, which I'll get to in a few minutes. Um, but then the question, given that we've had this sharp fall in demand, is what's that about? And we have a story, a story that, that's a very familiar one in economics that has informed a lot of discussion of the crisis and has informed a lot of discussion about, about reform, which is a story that uh, that is, is really about banking and the vulnerability of, of financial sectors. And my, what I'm going to argue is that while this story is, clearly has some truth to it, um, it's probably not the whole story or, or at this point the, the story that matters. But it has played such an important role in the debate that we need to talk about it first. So for, since we've got people who do financial economics here, I'm going to be, uh, it's almost baby talk what I'm going to be talking about. But uh, during the worst of it, 
So there was a period of extreme disruption of uh, financial markets in, uh, in uh, uh, roughly speaking, between September 15th, 2008, and more or less April or May of 2009, a period after the fall of Lehman and before stability started to return. Um, hasn't got a, we really need a name for that period. I've, I've been trying to suggest that it be called the, oh God, we're all gonna die period. Uh, but it hasn't, that hasn't sunk in, that hasn't been accepted. Um, there was a period of extreme disruption, which was of a type of phenomenon that is quite familiar. It was basically, we think, bank run. Um, and bank runs are something we've understood pretty well, at least in principle, for a long time. Um, a lot of people, and certainly in my neck of, of the woods, my part of, of the economics profession, spent that period wandering around muttering Diamond Divvig, Diamond Divvig, um, which is uh, the famous paper by, by Diamond, the other Diamond, uh, not, not Peter, um, Doug Diamond, and, uh, and Divvig, um, which laid out a very stylized picture of, of what it means to have a bank run. And the idea of Diamond Divvig is that think, you think of banks as being financial intermediaries that offer, um, offer people highly liquid assets. Their liabilities are things that, at least in the simple model, are just deposits, can be withdrawn at will, but in any case, things that can be converted into cash on short notice. Um, but their assets are illiquid. Their assets are longer term, but also more important, perhaps things that are not so, so easily uh, sold on short notice because they're, they're uh, um, there, there's some uncertainty about what they're really worth, um, which is a tremendously useful service. Um, ordinarily, we, individuals face a trade-off between liquidity and, and yield. Should I invest in, you know, should, should I put money into my brother-in-law's business, which has got great prospects, but if I should happen to need, uh, if I should happen to, to, to need to buy a new car, I won't have that money available. That's a very difficult trade-off. Um, what banks do, according to a Diamond Divvig type approach, is they, they largely eliminate the need to make that trade off, or at least they, they, they greatly re improve the terms of it. You can put your money in a bank where it becomes perfectly liquid, um, but the bank can use most of it to make loans or otherwise invest money that is not at all liquid. In, in ways that is not all liquid, in projects that can't be liquidated on short notice. And most of the time, there's no problem, because while I may need a new car or, uh, or plastic surgery or something, um, the odds are that, that not everybody will want that at the same time. And so the law of large numbers makes it possible for each individual to see himself or herself as having liquid assets, but at the same time to have the great bulk of those assets made available for illiquid investments. Which is great, and it's actually banks are a, a tremendous innovation uh, that are is very very helpful for for making the economy uh, work. It means that there's a lot less resources tied up in basically just hoarding cash. The trouble, of course, is that all of this depends on not everybody wanting their cash at the same time, and if something happens that makes people all want their cash at the same time, the bank gets broken. Uh, and people lose their money. Um, and also, probably a lot of disruption as banks scramble to liquidate those Ill illiquid assets. Um, and what might make people think that, what, what might make people all want to withdraw their funds at the same time? Well, the answer would be fear that the bank is going to fail. And of course, the bank will fail if every, so you see the point. There's a, there, inherent in banking, inherent in the very advantages that banking gives, um, is the idea that uh, that banks are banking systems are subject to the risk of self-fulfilling panics, that you can have a run on banks that generates through collapsing asset prices, through fire sales, generates the failure of, of banks, which is the thing that 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 cause, fear of that is what caused people to withdraw their funds all at once. So Diamond did think the original paper that's 30 years ago now um, was written somewhat in the tones of. That's a big problem, but it's one that we solved. And the way we solved it was with deposit insurance. We created, during the 1930s, a system of protections so that people could not lose their money, uh, and therefore rarely invoked, because in fact, once it's there, there's not going to be traditional bank runs, because people can't, can't lose their money all at once. Um, actually, we, at this point in class, we always talk about the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, 
probably many people have seen it, the old Christmas time movie with Jimmy Stewart, who's a heroic banker. Hard to believe that there's such a thing in a movie, but anyway. Um, heroic local small town banker. And there's, there is a bank run, is the climactic scene in the movie, um, which is, turns out, anachronistic. That all takes place a couple of years after World War II, a time when, in fact, we already had the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, and such things no longer happened. Now, along with the, the risk of, of course, you create deposit insurance, that creates a different problem, which is moral hazard. Once you have banks that can um, uh, offer deposits and people know that the deposits are protected, then there's a strong temptation for the banks to go out and take, make very risky loans. Because if they succeed, they make a lot of money. If they fail, well, it's someone else's problem. And it's the taxpayer's problem. And the depositors have no incentive to worry about it. So deposit insurance has to be accompanied by regulation, has to be accompanied both by requirements that uh, that um, banks limit the kinds of investments they make and also capital requirements that, that the owners of banks put up a significant amount of money, uh, put a significant amount of their own money at risk. All right, so all of that, well, we sort of evolved a system. Less, we, have a, we had a system a lot like that with, that had these essential features. It would be nice to imagine that that system had been created through very careful thought. It was actually sort of more or less cobbled together, but nonetheless, it ended up working pretty well. And we had what Gary Gordon at Yale calls the calm period, about 50 years when there were no major banking crises in the United States. Obviously, there were ones in emerging markets, largely because in emerging markets, uh, the, the liabilities were often in foreign currency and they lacked the resources to, to, to bail them out. But, uh, but in the United States and Western Europe, banking crises became a thing of the past. OK, so the story. I'm only now getting to the story of uh, that. The story, by the way, that I was telling three years ago about how we got into this. The story is that the banking system got out of control. Um, and it got out of control in part through deregulation but primarily through a failure to expand regulation um, as the nature of banking changed. And the, the great thing about, about these theoretical models is that they force you to ask, what is a bank? Because you have this theoretical, you know, this platonic ideal of a bank in the model, which is something that, that offers, whose liabilities purport to be liquid assets, but whose assets are, are, are not liquid. Um, that forces you to ask, what is a bank? And a bank, in, in, in the sense of the model, is not necessarily a bank as we normally name it. A bank, you know, it's not necessarily a big marble building with rows of tellers. Um, a bank is anything that issues assets that people perceive as being liquid, but that are backed by, um, by assets that, uh, that are, are, are in fact not liquid. Um, and that can be, of course, uh, any of a wide range of, of, of institutions. It can be, it can even be not really exactly assets, you know, it can be something like a, a auction rate securities, uh, which were, you know, widely used for financing a lot of things and, and purported to be fully liquid because you could always get out at the next auction, except what if the next auction failed, which was not contemplated as a possibility. So in effect, the, the, the Metropolitan Museum in New York which issued auction rate securities had become a bank, and didn't, but didn't realize it. And neither, of course, did the people who were putting their money at risk. Uh, more important, uh, money market funds, obviously, are banks uh, in the sense of the model. Again, um, any kind of asset-backed security um, became effectively banking. Uh, the uh, uh, investment banks, which are called banks, but we didn't think of as being banks, were, became, in fact, banks because they were issuing a lot of repo. Uh, which was functioning like cash, functioning like bank deposits, um, and all of these things being essentially unregulated, essentially uh, uh, not covered by, uh, unregulated and unguaranteed. So we ended up with a large part, by some measure, 60% of the U.S. banking system was non-bank banks, shadow banking. So this is uh, um, uh, uh, the, the great phrase maker of our time, I think, on these issues is Paul McCulley, formerly of, of PIMCO, uh, who, who came up with the term shadow banking, uh, also came up with the term Minsky moment, which we're going to come, come to in a little bit. Um, so the rise of shadow banking. Um, and if we'd been alert um, as these new forms of banking spread, uh, people would have said, hey, wait a second. These create all the same risks that deposit you know, the commercial banking, the depository institutions create, they should be covered by an umbrella 
of regulation that is essentially the same as what we offer to depository institutions. Um, but they aren't. And so we need to expand the regulation. And so we should have had a, a not so much new concepts and regulation as, as, a, as an expansion of, of the coverage uh, would have been tricky, actually, as, as, as we'll see. It, it, it turns out to be tricky. Uh, but it's, that, that's clearly what we should have done. But it didn't happen. And it didn't happen, I think, not it, it was not a, a, an accident or a contingent uh, feature. It's not that because of the particular people who were in charge that it didn't happen. The whole mood of economic policy, and certainly of financial market policy, was one of complacency about the risks of financial crisis um, and complacency about, uh, um, about the need for regulation. Uh, it just was not going to happen. We were actually moving, we were moving modestly to deregulate um, even conventional banking. So the, the uh, deregulation of conventional banking was proceeding, probably not the core of, of what went on, but certainly was, was part of what was happening. Glass-Steagall being arguably the least important of that part. More important, the uh, reductions in, in some, the, the elimination of some rules in the early 1980s. But in any case, there was a, since we were deregulating conventional banking, there was no constituency for an extension of regulation to cover shadow banking. Not, not even, no constituency, not even, nobody, it wasn't even on anybody's mind, really. I mean, or, I, there must have been somebody out there calling for it, but it wasn't really out there. Um, all of which was, you know, of course, coupled with, in the United States, uh, uh, exotic securities that purported to, uh, to eliminate risk and create high-grade risk-free assets. Uh, and it turned out that that, that was all an illusion. Uh, and so all of that. And so the story is we created this system by default of shadow banking and in the process had essentially restored uh, the kind of banking system we had in the 1920s. A system that was unregulated, unguaranteed, wide open to the possibility of diamond divvig type bank runs. And if we look at what, so this is just one of measure, many measures. I just pulled up this one. Um, this is asset back commercial paper. There's a whole lot of different things that, that look like that. Um, what happened? Really beginning in the summer of 2007, um, but then, of course, taking a, a major uh, further turn after the fall of Lehman, um, was that there were all these things that people thought were uh, safe assets, um, great stuff, liquid, safe, uh, what could go wrong, and all of a sudden they learned what could go wrong.